Hello everyone, right, I'm back on Dolphin Song. Uh, this one is two books in one, but I'm on Dolphin Song with Lawrence and John. This was our year six recommendation from Miss Jermack, our Grange librarian. Not going to finish this this holiday because it's really long and juicy and great book, but it's going to be in the library. So in the meantime, let's read along and you can always get it from the library if you like it. Chapter six. In a matter of hours, Martine's misgivings had been banished by the powerful salt-laden winds of the Cape and the sheer visual wonder of the sapphire blue sea which pounded its shores. It helped, too, that she hadn't had a moment to think. After a tour of the penguin colonies of Simonstown, home to South Africa's largest naval base, and a lunch of mango juice and smoked snook pate batter bread sandwiches, Miss Faulkner had sprung a surprise on them. Before boarding the ship for the sardine run, they were going to Shark Alley to watch tourists cage diving with great whites. Oh my goodness, great whites are these unbelievably massive, dangerous sharks. Um, I've been to Simon's Town as well many, many years ago. It's just interesting reading this book and remembering these places. Shark Alley. Even the name made Martine shiver. Her gut reaction when she'd heard the news was to pretend she'd come down with food poisoning. That way there'd be no danger of her nightmares coming true. That way she was unlikely to end up in the choppy blue bay encircled by sharks. Then it occurred to her that feigning illness at this stage of the journey before they were on board the main ship, would result in her being sent back to Salborna to face her grandmother. And even the shock seemed preferable to that. Barreling over the white-capped sea a little while later on a deep-sea fishing boat named Prowler 4, Martine was glad she hadn't given in to her fears. She told herself they were ridiculous. It's not as if every dream she had came true. Once she dreamt that she'd forgotten to put on her uniform and only realised her mistake when she walked into assembly at Caracol Junior, and to the best of her knowledge, that had never even come close to happening. As for the image on the cave wall, well, perhaps it only meant that she'd be spending a lot of time surrounded by sharks and dolphins, which she would. Perhaps the bushman had simply neglected to draw in the boat. Martine decided to stop fretting and enjoy the day. After all, what could go wrong? Safety checks on Prowler 4 had been stringent. Stinging pellets of spray peppered her face each time the boat hit a wave, but short of being bodily hurled overboard, there was very little chance of her ending up in the sea. Giza Rock was home to a colony of around 40,000 Cape fur seals and several hundred jackass penguins. The seals flopped around the rocks, barking and moaning and posing for pictures, their whiskers snouts turning this way and that. Their bodies shone like bronze in the pale sunshine. <laughs> Just a note from me, I love seals. Oh my gosh, they're so smelly. Gourmet food for sharks, joked Greg. Prowler skipper, skipper, a freckled South African with a bushy ginger beard. This is like restaurant row for great whites. Martine felt a twinge of sadness at the thought, but she understood that if too many seals were competing for space, mates and food, it would devastate their colony. The seals needed the sharks as much as the sharks needed the seals. As a result of the feast available to them, huge numbers of great whites congregated in the shallow channel between Dyer and Giza Island, and tourists came from all over the world to cage dive with them. Martine wasn't too sure what cage diving involved, but Greg explained that it provided an opportunity for everyone from nature lovers to adrenaline junkies to get up close and personal with the killers of the deep. There were different ways of doing it, but one of the most common was to use a cage made from galvanized steel mesh, 12 millimeters thick. Three or four people climbed inside and the cage was lowered into the midst of feeding sharks, often only a meter or so beneath the surface. Com conservationists, Greg said, were divided over cage diving. Some thought that it altered the behavior of sharks, increasing the risk of them attacking humans close to beaches. But others like Greg, who was passionate about sharks, hoped that by showing sharks in their natural habitat, more people would realize how incredible they were. Movies like Jaws had given them a bad name, but some sharks 
ate only plankton and it was rare for even great whites to prey on humans. Most shark attacks happened when sharks mistook surfers or swimmers for seals or fish. And this is just a note from me. I actually read the guy who wrote the book Jaws, which then became that famous movie by Steven Spielberg. His name was Peter Benchley, and I think he said he regretted that he ever wrote the book because it made people feel so negative about sharks. And um, i got to admit, I feel better about sharks now, but I did grow up feeling so negative about them, having seen that movie when I was about 10 years old. Um, I read the book as well. It's, it's hard to not feel negative about sharks, but like with like snakes. But I have been diving with sharks in an aquarium in Ellesmere Port called Blue Planet, and it is amazing to see these incredible creatures up close. Greg broke off his talk to maneuver Prowler alongside a smaller boat, which was already moored in Shark Alley. There were 10 tourists on the deck, the three Japanese businessmen, two Germans, and a party of friendly, talkative Americans, all of whom had film star teeth. They had spent the morning touring the islands and were very cheerful. They came aboard Pro Prowler, which was now pretty crowded, and drank mugs of coffee and rooibos. <laughs> you might have seen that in the shops. The Afrikaans named for red bush tea to fortify them for the cage diving experience. Martine sat chatting to Norm and Mary Weston, a couple from Florida who are on vacation to celebrate Norm's retirement from the staid world of vacuum cleaner sales. We're making it our mission to do all the things we were too chicken or too poor to do when we were young, Mar Mary told Martine with a wink. Norm said, why don't we go swimming with sharks? And I said, tell you what, darling, I'll let you swim with sharks if you let me go bungee jumping and whitewater rafting. So we made a deal. Martine enjoyed talking to them and admired their spirit of adventure. But when Norm donned the thick wetsuit, boots and gloves, which would protect him from the freezing temperatures of the winter water, she could tell that behind the bravado, Mary was extremely anxious. The sun had been swallowed by a bank of woolly cloud and the sea was more grey than navy. It did not look inviting. Greg, meanwhile, was busy pour, pouring chum, a mixture of ground-up fish heads and other foul-smelling bloody ingredients, guaranteed to lure sharks to the boat into the sea. He helped Norm and three other men into the cage, and they gasped and whooped as trickles of seawater made contact with their skin. Once the sharks appeared, the tourists would be lowered beneath the surface and would breathe through hoses fed with air from the boat. Behind his goggles, Norm's face was alight with anticipation. He looked 20 years younger than his 65 years. Over there, Scott Henderson shouted, and everyone rushed to his side of the boat where a swishing black shadow was rising slowly from the deep. It was so enormous that Martine thought at first it was a whale, but as it neared the surface, the unmistakable outline of a shark became visible. Without warning, it burst from the sea. The children and tourists reeled back. For one terrifying moment, it hung in the air, so close to the boat, it seemed it would land in it, and Martine saw at close range its flat grey snout corpse like eyes and crooked rows of needle teeth then it belly flopped back into the ocean sending a gruesome shower of chum and icy water their way i think i read that shark when their teeth break they're just more teeth that grow not like human beings other great whites quickly joined it and soon these were as many as there and soon there were as many as eighteen sharks surrounding the boat. Their fearsome jaws snapped at the fish heads floating close to the cages. Martin could make out Norm secure behind the steel mesh, snapping away with his underwater camera. All at once he stopped taking photographs and became agitated. There seemed to be a problem with his air hose. The boat assistant ran to start the machinery to raise the cage, and Greg rushed to help Norm. Even before the skipper reached him, Norm had opened the lid of the cage and was attempting to clamber out. Slow down, Norm, warned, warned Greg, leaning out over the water. The sharks are in a feeding, feeding frenzy. You'll be okay, but you need to let me help you. Norm smiled bravely, put a foot on the edge of the cage and reached for Greg's freckled hand. Later, when Martine tried to piece together the events of that afternoon, the thing that struck her was that it was true about accidents happening in slow motion. In reality, obviously, they took place in a split second, but that has, wasn't how they felt at the time. 
One moment Martine was watching Norm balance on the edge of the cage like a black-winged crane reaching for Greg's hand. The next time it slowed to a crawl and she was watching as American, unsteady from lack of oxygen, missed Greg's fingers and fell backwards into a churning grey sea. The wheeling goals matched Mary's screams. Norm landed with a terrific splash, temporarily scattering the sharks. The scene took on a surreal quality. It didn't seem possible that the smiling man with whom Martine had been sharing coffee and biscuits barely half an hour earlier was now flailing about in the bloody water fate, fighting for his life. But this was no movie. The largest of the great whites, a prize specimen of about 22 feet, Greg had told them that it probably weighed close to 7,000 pounds, had already changed direction was on its way back to see if Norm was edible. The boat was a madhouse, with Greg appealing for calm while his assistant hung over the edge with a bow hook. He planned to bash the shark on the nose, its most sensitive part, if it came within range. The menacing shadow circled Norm twice. The pinched snout of the shark poked above the water, and its mouth opened briefly as if it was testing to see how much of him it could bite off in one go. It was then that Martine seized her chance. She focused her green eyes on the shark's sunken grey ones, summoned all the furious energy she could muster, and directed it at the shark in a conscious stream, the way she'd once done with a rot-violet dog. She willed it to leave Norm alone. Oh my gosh. To find something its own size to terrorise, or better still, to consider a diet of plankton. The shark's head dipped beneath the surface. The assistant threw the boat hook, but it fell wide and drifted away on the current. Stop! Martine yelled at the shark in her head. Stop! But the great white was already in motion. It was like a torpedo, sleek and deadly, shooting towards the stricken man. As it approached, its jaws stretched wide, and its rows of serrated teeth were plainly visible. In seconds, Norm would be missing an arm, his head, or even his torso. Stop! Martine yelled silently. The shark veered away with an irritable flick of its tail. It vanished into the camouflage of the sea. The waves created by its passing shoved Norm hard against the side of the boat, where willing hands hauled him from the water. Mary fell on him with kisses and cries of thanks. When you said you wanted to swim with sharks, I didn't think you'd meant you'd be doing it outside the cage, she scolded her husband in a trembling voice, but it was said with humour and a lot of love. A warm glow spread through Martine. She gave an involuntary cheer, but nobody noticed in the general bedlam. Everyone was talking at once as they tried to work out why the shark had changed course. At the last second, it figured out that you weren't a seal, Norm reasoned a mightily relieved Greg, as he rushed about getting hot towels and sweet tea for his shaking client. Humans are just not natural prey for sharks. Well, I sure am glad about that, Norm said as the colour returned to his cheeks. Now at least I get to dine out on the story. In the midst of all the chaos, something made Martine look up. While everyone else on the boat was focused on the Westerns' reunion, Ben, sitting cross-legged on the roof of Prowler's cabin, was focused on her. He was smiling. Whew, pretty exciting chapter. Well, that was pretty scary. Pretty interesting. Okay, next time we're on chapter 7, page 256.